So as you know that August is anyway special for Indian science because 15th of August was the day when uh, ISRO had started 55 years back now and uh, a, a, I mean a momentous occasion of uh, start, a start towards India becoming uh, self-independent in space technology and also benefiting the human, uh, the masses who are part of the Indian pop population and ISRO has been working towards that for a long time. Now, of course, uh, with all the uh, insats and other special satellites which are looking towards the Earth, we've got a great what we call the constellation of satellites, not of stars, but satellites up in the sky, uh, which are uh, helping us in various ways, unknown to us sometimes. And this is the day of celebration where we start looking for what are these ways in which they come into our lives. Ayuka has a special connection. We are the inter-university center for astronomy and astrophysics, as you will know. And therefore, this subject which has researchers looking up into space, studying all the outs, objects outside the Earth with various kinds of observatories, I would call them, with different kinds of telescopes. Uh, we have always had a great presence in the international research community. However, there are some special requirements of astronomers to, uh, that need them to have their telescopes up in space. They, uh, these requirements can only therefore be uh, you know, taken care of by a collaboration with space agencies who have the capacities to take telescopes to space. And of course, there are many other instruments, not just telescopes. So this lovely collaboration has been happening and uh, sometimes we mix up space science with astronomy and they are all connected through space. But to make the connection more clear okay, and exactly known to you, we have uh, organized this special session today here, where we'll be discussing uh, about a special satellite which India has launched, a uh, satellite which has several telescopes on board. And it is one of the unique things, uh, one of the unique instruments up there in space. Well, uh, so <clears throat> today we've been having a lot of celebration about Chandrayaan. Okay, last year I remember this hall was full with uh, so many uh, people. Maybe some, maybe some of you also uh, actually watching live on the screen the landing of uh, Chandrayaan. We all cheered for that. Okay, a few uh, uh, weeks later, another uh, important event happened, which is the launch of Aditya L1. Okay which again we uh, shared with all of you in this, in this hall. So this, this, have been, uh, this has been a really great year and very happy that we are celebrating it today here in the Chandrasekhar Auditorium, again reliving those memories uh, from the past year. Aditya L1 also has some component, particularly a telescope on it, which uh, has been made in Ayuka, a few, hundred, a few tens of meters away from you is the lab where it was designed and made. So we are quite proud to also share that with you. Now for today's uh, interaction, for today's talk, we have with us uh, Professor Kanak Saha, uh, researcher at Ayuka, and he uh, has prepared this talk about a particular, as I said, I'm keeping the mystery, the suspense, the particular satellite uh, space telescope called AstroSat. Uh, I will uh, request him to uh, come on stage while I introduce him briefly. Uh, uh, Dr. Kanak Saha is, from, um, is originally from West Bengal, where, Northern Bengal, where he uh, studied during his uh, childhood in school. And then he uh, graduated from Scottish Church College uh, and had a BSc in Physics. He did his Masters from the Banaras Hindu <coughs> University and then a PhD from the Indian Institute of Science. He uh, has been very active in astronomy and astrophysics and is now a professor at Ayuka. He was actually <coughs> awarded the very uh, prestigious Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize for Science and Technology in the Physical Sciences category uh, for his actually his discoveries using this telescope. So we are very happy to uh, welcome him and very eager to listen to all the exciting things that he does that he's going to share with us today. Thank you very much, Kanak. Good evening, everyone. 
Um, I must say that I feel a bit nervous to talk to you, uh, but I hope it will uh, erase over time. Um, what I'm going to talk today is about exploring a very special subject in astrophysics. This is called the cosmic reionization. Um, using Indian AstroSat. The subject is a very complex subject and uh, this will take you to not anywhere near to Earth but all the way to the, uh, the beginning of the universe. That's what we are going to um, um, learn today a bit on that. So the, the day anyway as Samir has explained that this is a very special day. Today we are celebrating National Space Day the first year of the Chandrayaan tree launch and um, uh, this is uh, basically we are, we are uh, celebrating the, 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 the ISRO's journey to the outer space and the exploration to the, the outer space. Um, in that I try, I kept a very uh, YouTube video so it looks, um, the, uh, it was a Chandrayaan tree launch, so I picked up a video from the YouTube. Um, I may, <coughs> sorry. I will not go through all of this, but this guy starting from Delhi wants to like you know, look for the launch and go for the sites of this, the Chandrayaan 3 launch. The kind of excitement that you see and it's been like prevailing even today. So. So I not go through. So he did not get a place to like you know go to the ISRO uh, site where the launch is happening, and then finally he makes some jugar and and then finally like try to like reach there. And so the end is like what we wanted to see a kind of excitement. the excitement I wanted to share. So that was the excitement of the year ago and then that's what you should Remember. So this was a big achievement for India's uh, space agency that we landed on moon safely and uh, this is the Bikram lander and the program and it um, was live for nine days on the surface of the moon. Interestingly, this is a very exciting news that came today that the program satellite, the, the rover during its nine, during its nine day like travel on the, on, the, on the moon surface, it has collected some data and that has been published in a nature paper and it has found that moon had an ancient magma ocean. So it's a, it's a very, very exciting, exciting news. So both from the science part and also for the technology development. So it's, a, it's an amazing time for, for, for Indian, Indian space program. Okay. So we will, as I said, like of course we'll go beyond from here and we will look at um, the subject of the talk today is not of course to the Chandra M3 but we will go to some other telescope is AstroSat. And the subject is of course, as I said, very complex. So first of all, you know, what is cosmic reionization? So various questions come, how did the cos cosmic dark age end? And why do you need to worry? Um, what are the sources responsible for the cosmic reionization and all of that? And then how, what is AstroSat doing in this context? So that's what the subject of today's talk. So to do, to do that, I'll take you, I'll walk you through a journey. From, from very like from the from the 
surface of the earth to all the way up to the, the early universe. And if you look at this is the night sky from Han Ladakh, the Indian Astronomical Observatory. And uh, you see the beautiful patch of the Milky Way uh, galaxy, is our own galaxy. And if you look this one, is uh, basically the, is a lighter? This one um, is the, the disk of the Milky Way, is a Milky Way galaxy taken by a Gaia satellite. Okay. This is also a uh, recent satellite and this is the large Magellanic cloud and the small Magellanic cloud. Amazing, and this was the Gaia satellite is still running, and it's, it's working. I'll show you a movie. The Gaia is going to um, map about a billion stars, measure the billion stars, position, velocity, everything, and with that one can actually like see how each of these stars will be in in a, in a, in a and then time from now to future. So what we can what we can do these stars, we know the position and velocity, and then with that we see how they will be moving and how they're changing their structure. So this is possible now with, with this Gaia satellite, and this is an amazing thing. And Milky Way is the only <coughs> galaxy in which we can look at the stars individually. Okay. See, so there are various so th there's a lot of excitement is going to also come from this the satellite because each of the stars trajectory we know and we know uh, how they will be in, in for a predictive power as well. So when you look at the individual stars, what do we know? That we, we know the stars, like sun is our like nearest star and sun, the light from the sun is follows a black body radiation. So to your high school, I believe like everyone will know. <coughs> it emits in all wavelengths and it uh, depends on a temperature. So it's not mathematics, but I'm going to just, it's important that this black body radiation from the star is described by a Planck's law. Okay? And it has, it depends on the temperature. The higher the temperature, the peak of this black body shifts towards the shorter wavelength. Okay? So it's a shorter wavelength, shorter wavelength say UV. So you go from ultraviolet visible to infrared or if the temperature increases temperature of the surface temperature of the sun star so the peak will be shifted towards the blue or the shorter wavelength and if the temperature is so high that the if it is 80,000 Kelvin some stars are there whose temperature is like quite high like 40,000 50,000 Kelvin for example sun the surface temperature as you know is 5,000 Kelvin right so then that would be emitted by a, a young massive stars which is like there are various class of stars so like o type stars b type stars they are young massive big like objects and they predominantly emit in the ultraviolet okay now we a very small um, physics or astrophysics that you know is that the lifetime of a star depends inversely proportional to the mass of the star. So big massive stars live shorter. Massive stars live shorter. So in other words, hotter they are, brighter they shine and shorter they live. So this has a very profound implication as what I am going to like you know, scroll through. Okay? So remember this, the big massive stars means they will live shorter. Okay. Now, amount of light, when you look at a star, we must, not just the temperature of the star, but we can also, also estimate how much light is coming to the telescope. Okay. So this is measured in terms of a, some astronomical quantity called magnitude. I am not going to explain that, but I am going to explain something this rough. So for some, the, let us say the magnitude is minus 26.78, the apparent magnitude. If you look at the brightest star, Sirius is minus 1.46 magnitude. If you look at the Vega, it is a zero magnitude. You know all Shakti Rishi Mandal? This end is called Rigu. Rigu has a magnitude which is about plus 1.9. Okay? With naked eye, we can see stars which are the six magnitude. 
okay which means from top to down you go the the positive and higher the number which means they are fainter and fainter right is it clear it's fainter and fainter and with the faintest galaxy that you can observe by hubble is 31 magnitude this is that faint can you okay. so that's the that's the um, that's the way we can cal calculate the light and, and measure the magnitude and how faint can you okay so and one magnitude changes the brightness by a factor of 2.5 if it changes from one magnitude you can say that the brightness changes by factor of 1.5 it's like basically goes down gets fainter and fainter now we look at the milky way galaxy this is not actual picture of the milky way galaxy it's an artist impression this is the center of the milky way and we are at sun this is sun from the center of the milky way this distance is about 8.5 kiloparsec and total distance or the size of the milky way is a 30 kiloparsec okay. and this is where we are solar system with with all the planets the sun is going around the galactic center it goes around round round with a speed about 220 kilometer per second this is few numbers to remember so one parsec would be 3.2 light years or 30 trillion kilometer and if one kilo is 30,000 trillion kilometer. Okay. So these numbers are any astronomical, so, so it's uh, no, nothing to be scared of. Now, when you look at the galaxies like Milky Way, they are made up of billions of stars that I showed you like the Gaia fish. So the billions of stars. Gaia would be measuring only about a billion stars. Okay. Apart from the stars, there are gas. Dominant is the nuclear hydrogen gas, atomic hydrogen gas in the galaxy molecular hydrogen and as well as there are dark matter in the galaxy for which we know little. Okay. Light from a galaxy, when you collect total light, they, since the stars emit in many different wavelengths, you can see the from the black body radiation, this galaxy would also emit in different different wavelengths. So we can measure the light from the galaxy and same galaxy if you look at in infrared it looks like this, then optical it looks like this. If a near ultraviolet, it looks like this, and the far ultraviolet is completely different. Okay, why? So this far ultraviolet thing that you see here, it means that the what I, you remember that the, when the stars emit mostly in the far ultraviolet, which means they are young, massive stars, they are short lived, which means this galaxy may not be making young, massive stars. Okay, in a very simple extrapolation from the what we learned right so which means that this galaxy only this part is making like a lot of stars young massive stars rest of the galaxy are not making young stars now okay so this is a crucial information that is useful for us to move ahead and uh, in astronomy when you look at these graphs don't be afraid these are all basically different filters so you can put a blue filter you can put a green filter so within that filter only the light will come and we will measure the light from the galaxy. Rest of the other wavelength will be blocked. Right? So, we can measure the uh, light from a galaxy external object through a different different filters. And we can, why we need different different filters? Because we need to know the galaxy in different different wavelengths. Because different wavelengths speaks different physics. So, if you only look at only very part, you will not know. It is almost like a, uh, looking at an elephant in the room and only look at a very tiny part and you wouldn't know like what the full picture is. So, that to understand the full picture, you need many different wavelength coverage. Okay? Now, apart from the light that we collect, we also have something called the spectra in the galaxy. So, the gas in the, in the, the uh, as I said, the dominant gas is that atomic hydrogen gas this is like hydrogen atom and if you the electron goes around in the let's say one of the uh, orbit and and it goes to the excited state and give a different kind of a line right emission line so these are like hydrogen alpha this is line and alpha depending on where the transition comes so it's a simple atomic transitions gives you different different uh, emission lines from the galaxy and they speak about the physics in the interstellar medium. 
Interstellar medium means the medium between the stars, which is filled with gas. It can be atomic hydrogen gas, it can be ionized gas, it can be like molecular hydrogen gas, right? So when you look at a galaxy like this, any external galaxy, you see many different spectra. This is the hydrogen alpha line, this is the hydrogen beta line, this is called a Barmer series line, basic school physics, right? And when you look at a galaxy, they could be moving away from us, it could be coming towards us. So if it is receding, then the this same line will be shifted to the red shifted or could be blue shifted with respect to the spectrum that you take from the lab spectrum. See in for example, hydrogen alpha we know is emitted at 6563 angstrom, right? As you, if it is a far away, then the, 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 it is receding from us, then the line will be shifted from the 6563, it will be uh, coming from different wavelength, okay? So this is how we also know how far the galaxy is, okay? A little explanation from here when they say that the, the, the one is that is emitting the light and is receiving as it goes away from us the wavelength gets stressed okay this is known as red shifting and this is what basically we measure and they are very simple relation what do you observe and those emitted so imagine a, the galaxy is emitting a light and it's moving away from us it will be red shifted by an amount called z. So, this z is represented by red shift okay? and it also tells you how far the galaxy is from us. Okay? This will be important because we will be going to the very far uh, from us and this is where if you look at for example, uh, AF, effort from our Milky Way galaxy, right? we are when you look at in the night sky, you see stars all around, these are all stars of the Milky Way. right? What is beyond the Milky Way, you do not see stars individually, you see galaxies. And this is what basically uh, a video of a nearby universe taken by Sloan Digital Sky Survey and you can see that each of these objects are basically galaxy and it's for each galaxy we know the where they are actually and the movie is made using that concept. Okay? You can, you can see and what you can see is much more because you see some of the galaxies are like a cluster together, some of the galaxies are like less dense environment, these are not, uh, uh, they are empty region also. So, so these are basically called a different environment in the galaxy. Okay. So, so a lot of like interesting structures and, and, and the details that we, we get to know. This is all mostly the nearby universe from us. If you go to the far, farther than what SDSS or the Sloan Digital Sky Survey could do, we do not forget the extraordinary contribution made by Hubble. The Hubble in 1995 looked at a very small uh, patch of the sky in the southern hemisphere near the Fornax cluster uh, constellation. And what came out of this exploration was what is known as a deep field, Hubble deep field. So the Hubble deep field is basically gives us a way to look into the deep space. Okay. In other words, in astronomy, is an only unique subject where we talk about the past. Okay. We don't have anything like you no know, whatever the light is emitted is emitted like you no know, some time ago, and this is what we are seeing. And Hubble is like made an amazing contribution to that. Also, you can see a very uh, a movie made by ESA, the European Space Agency. It's about the Hubble deep field. <coughs> That's where the zooming into the region of the fornax, and that's where the deep field. And we know redshift of each of these galaxy, so we can sort of this used to make this movies through. Look at this object. 
and this is the object supposed to be known as the furthest galaxy some time ago. These are the redshift of 10.7 when the universe was just 420 million years old. Okay, compared to what we today is 13.8 billion years old. So it's a very, very young universe. So this red shape probes a very, very, that this is how the, the object looks like. This is a galaxy. Later, this is another furthest galaxy, even farther, by Hubble only. And this is a red shape of 11.1. .1. And this is thought to be like, you know, very low mass galaxy, 100 times the mass of a Milky Way galaxy. Now comes the JWST, the things have changed. So we know the, the farthest galaxies from JWST now, and this is the starting at redshift 9.5, where do we know the confirmation from spectra. The spectroscopy gives you a confirmation of what exactly the redshift, because we can measure the shift of the line, right? So that shift of the emission lines can give you exact location and this is how the galaxy looks like at redshift 9.5 from JWS to James Webb Space Telescope. This is another candidate galaxy here. This is an Abel 2744 cluster, so very famous. You should type in the Google and see. And this also have a redshift 10.5, redshift 12.5 object. Then there are, this is JH survey. There are various surveys going on, a very exciting time in, in astronomy now. Uh, you can see various galaxies at redshift, farthest one is in the redshift 13.2 and this is what the galaxy is. Mostly like, looks like a noisy pixels here, right? And these are 13.2. <coughs> and then the farthest known galaxy to date came in a few days ago and it is redshift 14. Okay? And this is where one can see the spectra of the galaxy and you can see this is how the spectra is taken on this object and you can see it is, this is some way to like say that this is the furthest galaxy we know. Now where, yeah. just a moment. And so if you look at actually the magnitude of the galaxy, you can see the luminosity of the galaxy on the y axis and plot it as a function of the age of the universe. 200 million year age and then 300, 400, 500, 600 million years. And these two galaxies are right sitting at when the universe was just 300 million years old. It's unbelievable. If you look at the time history of the universe, these galaxies would be falling right in probably the, where the cosmic dark age was. I'm going to explain now this part. This is where we, the subject matter of the talk today, Okay, so this is where we wanted to know what happened here, right? Interestingly, if we look at the galaxies that we measure, this is from the Hubble, at a redshift of 0.5, ratio of 0.92, then this one is a redshift of 2.3, these are measured by Hubble, this is measured by Hubble, just means so, right? And these are measured by JWST. As I explained to you in the very beginning that we measure the galaxy light in different, different filters. We put filters, different filters. So these galaxies are measured in, in optical filters, observed in optical filters, observed. JWST works in the infrared. This is the infrared telescope. So it has many infrared filters. This is observed in infrared, which means that the emitted light must be in UV, the TV. So the, the, the light, the photons that emitted when the galaxy was there was an UV and they got red shifted all the way and found in the infrared band. Okay. So this is important. Now what is important because the, the, what we measure and what we observe is like what we what we showing. From here if you want to know actually what happened, you need to go to what's called the emitted light like you know, with the, the light which was emitted at that time. So that's the rest from UV. You see the light was emitted in UV. When it comes to UV, this is a very special class of objects which are interested in, which is again the subject. The imaging of the galaxy at rest from wavelength less than 912 angstrom is rare. 
In UV, means what is the wavelength range of UV? Around 1500 angstrom to all the way up to 3000 angstrom, right? So that's the wavelength, and then this is very rare. Okay. Why? Because this 912 angstrom corresponds to an energy of 13.6 electron volt. When a 13.6 electron volt photon hits an hydrogen atom, it ionizes the hydrogen atom. Right? So very basic. See? So this is called the hydrogen ionization, and this is an insignificant event. Looks like a phenomena. Nothing, but these are profound implications. What we're going to learn. Today. Okay. So that's the that's the this is the key here. So this takes us to the all the way up to like let's say we start in the beginning. How this all why why care about why care about this hydrogen ionization, right? This event. So if you look at the history of the universe, this is an, there are various various event. So before CMB or in the very early universe, the the we had only the the hot plasma, the elementary particles are separated, right? And then as the universe cooled down and expanded and cooled down, they got chance to combine again, recombine again. Okay. So that recombination happened at some point when at the redshift about 1100, and at that time. This is marked by what is called the cosmic microwave background. Okay? At that point, the protons and electrons recombined and made hydrogen atom. And because uh, there are not much heavy element produced in the very early universe from the Big Bang nucleus synthesis, so there are only few helium atoms and mostly hydrogen gas. So at that, this is the time when there was no stars, there is no galaxy formed yet. Okay? Formed yet. So this is basically marked by what is called the cosmic dark age. The cosmic dark age is an, an, an era where there were no stars, there is no galaxy formed. Okay? This is the dark age because it is only hydrogen atom, so we do not see anything. There is no, no light is emitted. Right? So it is very opaque to us. Okay? As the universe like, like cooled down further, and um, the first stars and galaxy formed. Okay, the first stars that would be formed made from the pure hydrogen gas, with a few elements of the heavy elements like helium only, right? So those stars would be called the first generation stars, and those first generation stars, because there is no heavy element, they would be very massive. And what we learned in the beginning. Most massive stars live very short time. So that these stars that will be made would be like 100 times the mass of the sun and their lifetime would be less than a million year. It is a very short time compared to the astronomical time scale. Right? So these first stars would very quickly go explode and the high energy photons would be coming out of that and started sort of ionizing the hydrogen gas which is surrounding right so because this this event imagine like you now you have a sea of hydrogen gas but only very pockets like you now where the the stars collapse the gas collapse <coughs> and form the first stars not everywhere right it is not simultaneously that all the hydrogen gas will be converted to stars no it's not like that if there is an efficiency there is a very complex process for this right so those are the first stars like if formed somehow they will be formed in various pockets and from the pockets these photons will come out very extreme UV photons and they start reionizing the hydrogen that is called the reionization. The hydrogen is getting ionized second time earlier it was ionized then it recombined and then it is second time again. and then <coughs> it clears the path and, 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 and we can we could see light and this process continued for some time. So this is sort of from the beginning of the first stars of galaxy <coughs> this, the reionization started and it went on for some time about a giga year and is, it is known right now at the redshift 5.5 is where probably the reionization ended. When the reionization ended means that the matter between the galaxies become all ionized now. 
matter between the galaxies are all ionized now and <coughs> so the, for that also you can have a very nice movie here which is talking about the end of the, the dark age this is what I just explained so in the beginning you have the hydrogen gas which collapse in a very small pockets this is the region of the ionization region of the ionization the UV photons that came out from the small small pockets and the dark part is the hydrogen gas so that is it, it's, it's a very complex process how we do not know how it happened actually but we wanted to know so you can see that as the this this regions like now got expanded because it ionizes the hydrogen gas and it we could see through otherwise we would not be seeing the universe so that's that's the that's the effect of the extreme uv photons that came out of the first stars or started ionizing the hydrogen gas and this is the phenomenon the question that comes here like you know what fraction of the photons that came out from from this right what fraction of those photons that can ionize the hydrogen gas came out of the galaxy or the first stars that is what we wanted to know and that's a very complex so this is represented by something called the fraction of the ionizing photons okay so this is the ratio of two quantity it's very simple number of the ionizing photons that is produced in the galaxy in the denominator okay and number of the ionizing photons that escaped simply this is called the escape fraction so it should be very simple to measure right but it turns out this not the this one requires a direct measurement direct measurements we look at a galaxy and we want to know how many photons came out of the galaxy not the photons with the ionizing photons the photons that can are capable of ionizing hydrogen gas right the denominator depends on very complex the model of the galaxy intrinsic spectrum of the galaxy right the intrinsic properties of the galaxy the state of the interstellar medium dust metal many things so this is unknown so we don't know actually how to because we don't observe this and then once those photons are produced they have to be transported to you nearby somewhere where you observe so they pass through from the from the site where it is produced and where where we measure right so those photons have to travel and that's a very complex process as well so it's a measuring this is a very very complex so provided you know this provided you measure this provided you have some idea about how to model and it's just a very very complex thing so i will not go through this but um, uh, it's just the math it's, don't worry about that it's a very simple thing so first thing is that the photons that is produced in a galaxy some site let's say right the ionizing photons their mean free path if you calculate is a very short like 0.5 parsec is a very high is a high school formula right one over the the sigma and the density right sigma is a cross section is a the, the, the number density so it's a very small and it turns out that the mean free path of these photons are much less less than the size of the galaxy size of the galaxy is like 10000 parsec and is a 0.5 parsec so as soon as the photons gets like these photons gets emitted from the region local region they can be absorbed by the hydrogen gas which is existing in the galaxy itself right so so they their chances that they come out of the interstellar medium is also not so easy okay. and suppose this is a cartoon where the photons struggle to come out of the interstellar medium of the galaxy there will be like some which is called the sargam galactic medium is a gas around the galaxy so they can also absorb and if some photons try to like you know manage both come out they have to travel all the way from the galaxy to you for you can measure right with your instrument and in the path they can be also absorbed because there are like floating hydrogen gas somewhere they can be absorbed so this makes 
it is very very difficult for measuring the hydrogen the this this kind of photons the ionizing photons which is responsible for ionizing the hydrogen gas in the outer universe okay and this this transmission here we can like see that the the this is called the transmission thinking about that suppose there are 100 photons starting in here and if there are like reaching let's say one so it's basically you can say that so many photons are absorbed so we can also think about what kind of probability transmission allow and it seems that as you go to the higher and higher redshift redshift six and above which is mark the reionization era you know reionization ended at redshift 5.5 this is what i saw by that time you go there the transmission probability is almost zero so which means that it's a not easy to escape these photons can't like probably escape and we can measure so it's a very difficult problem and that's where we are trying to think do things with the exploring with astrosat and astrosat is the first uh, indian space observatory uh, launched in 2015 28 october okay it has um, five telescopes which summit just said there are like these are the x-ray telescope and uh, there is one uv imaging telescope what we'll be looking at today is using the uv imaging telescope the ultraviolet imaging telescope which works in this web, wavelength range 1300 angstrom to 3000 angstrom and if you look at what astrosat will see astrosat will see first that was believed that you look at the nearby galaxies neutron stars extra binaries transient sources many things so astrosat is a big promising thing and it's a truly a multi wavelength space observatory multi wavelength means it works in the x-ray various wavelengths and then uv and then you know also optical this is also a very interesting thing it's not just the multi wavelength it's also a multi institute collaboration okay which is a very amazing thing that is under isro the indian institute of astrophysics ayuka chaifer raman research institute ncra physical research laboratory Canadian Space Agency, you know, all of them got together and made this uh, telescope. Okay, so it's a, it's a truly a multi-institute collaboration, and I think this is uh, this is something that one should be looking for. And so, looking at the UVIT telescope, the ultraviolet imaging telescope, this has two telescope. One works in the far ultraviolet FUV, one works in the near ultraviolet. The two co-align; they observe simultaneously. Okay, they observe simultaneously, and it has a detector which is called the where we take the imaging. You heard about the CCD, so it's a CMOS detector. So what we did is that we point the astrosat to the same place where Hubble looked at long ago, uh, the Hubble Deep Field where Hubble Deep Field was created. So we use the astrosat to point to the same direction, and, and we observed. And astrosat observes like in a way very like two 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 lines as they said they are simultaneous so way it observes that it goes around the orbit it takes about 97 minutes to go and each orbit. of the 97 min minutes only a small fraction is available for us to observe because we have to block like stay away from the sun right and then it takes shots like image and Delta T between two shots, like in a very quick imaging it takes, is a 33 milliseconds. So every 33 milliseconds, you will take one shot of the sky. Okay. And these are like sort of, so in a typical orbit, we have basically only about 1500 seconds available. Instead of 97 minutes. Okay. So it's, this is why the 20 to 25 percent efficiency. Okay. And if you look at the one orbit, so in a, in a uh, 15 hundred second observation, so you divide by the 33 like milliseconds, so you get about this many frames, so about 45,000 frames in a given orbit. So we observed with Astrosat about, about 40 orbits, so 40 times 45,000 frames, so, so many frames we have. Okay? So this is basically what the image looks like in a given orbit image, so it looks very unimpressive. If you look at the zoom in this, this is how it looks like. And each of these box, if you look at, they look like this. Basically ones and zeros, basically. Okay. This is how the imaging in one orbit looks like. 
So now if you combine all the frames that we got with the software, this is how it looks. Like. It's much better. Okay, and and when you look at the combine in multicolor images, this is what we created and we call the associative TVD field. Okay, and this is what done by the two filters in the AstroSat and two filters in the HST. So this is what the associative TVD field, the blue and the cyan are representing the AstroSat observation. Some comparison, you can see this is the HST and this is the AstroSat, not bad. Okay, so here we have see one to one correspondence of this. And even we compare with the AstroSat, HST and the JWST and you can see that it's a, it's a, you can see that these details are not there, right? Details are not there, but the unique thing is that we are complementing. JWST observes in the infrared, it is in the optical window. We are providing the UV data. This is, this is very unique. And when you go to the rest frame, it is actually unique. <coughs> As you said, the UV-8 imaging is much, much like you, know, you can see. It's a, it's a one of the class instrument, I would say. One of the best right now in UV. So, coming back to how do we detect the what we wanted to detect, the, the, the photons that ionize the hydrogen gas, right? So, we have two filters in AstroSat. One is a far UV filter, one is a near UV filter. So, we say that we have, if we have a galaxy that is detected in this filter and it has a red shift, I explained to what is red shift, is greater than 0.97, then we say that this is a, those galaxies from which we have photons can ionize the hydrogen gas. Okay, that's the one. And if you look at, if you observe in this filter, then we can, because the observed observe wavelength is a bit higher, so it can go even higher redshift. Okay, so further. So with AstroSat, we can like see that. So before AstroSat, you can see this is on the redshift on the x-axis, and this is what basically the ratio of ionizing to the non-ionizing photons and these are the observations that we knew in low red shift about 0.4 and 0.3 and this is not too far from when AstroSat this AstroSat was launched 2015 we observed in 2016 so 2016 this thing came out this data but there was no observation on this side from any telescope so far so after AstroSat we have the first observation from this and this was published in Nature Astronomy and most interesting thing is that this, this, the emitted wavelength, remember, the emitted wavelength, at what wavelength they are emitting, that is the unique thing. The associate caught the 600 angstrom photons for the first time in entire astronomy. This is how the, the Hubble Extreme Deep Field, if you look at the associate eye, and this is the galaxy that we are talking about or which was detected at redshift of 1.4. This is the galaxy. Okay. And if you look at in AstroSat, they don't look very good. So they look like only some pixels here. That is how it is actually. So later, I think we have uh, detected many such galaxies with uh, 10 liquors has been uh, 10 galaxies which emit this ionizing photons. So this was published in Abjad letter by Suraj Diver, one of my students, and we calculate the escape fraction as well. Okay, because we model and this is not just the only thing. Then recently we have another uh, data for we 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 looked at the merging galaxy and and at redshift of 1.09, let's say 1. Point, and from which also we calculated the escape fraction, and that came out to be about 0.12. So this is what basically the current status, if you see the redshift and the measurement of the escape fraction. Escape fraction, remember what we want to know actually from that. Now, you may be thinking that the reionization happened at much further redshift, right? These are not when the reionization happened, right? Because that reionization happened beyond redshift 5.5, right? This is what are we doing here. So, as I explained to you, 
that you go to the realization era, we don't have any observation. So what we want to understand is that look at the lower redshift galaxies and try to understand that what is the nature of those galaxies which contributed the realization, right? So because we do not know, so we need an understanding like no one. So that's why we look at the low redshift object, okay? And to our luck, so this is what basically contributing astrosat in this understanding. So these are all from the observation from Hubble Space Telescopes and some other telescope. And these are also from Hubble Space Telescope mostly. Some are <coughs> other instruments. And, and this is the unique place for astrosat. And it's not just the unique in that sense. So emitted wavelength wise, we are the shortest wavelength photos that we are catching with astrosat. This is something very unique about astrosat. So the astrosat is able to catch those photons that have very short wavelength. Okay? And to our luck, we actually look at the galaxy at redshift 5.9, which is right in the reionization era. Okay? And we have a detection where we saw that there's an, uh, there's a, you can see here, this is what the this is how it looks like. We're very faint. Uh, we zoom in, it looks like that, and this is the galaxy. And uh, this is this is su supposed to be in the, in the within the reionization era. So you can you can see that as I explained to you, this is where the reionization ended, and just before reionization ended, we have an object which measured with astrosat, and astrosat is able to like you know, now come up to all the way up to low redshift to like the first time. Okay, so this would be the the first time. Astrosat will be directly probing the ionizing photons from the directly from the realization era. Okay, so we, so that's the that's the story about the realization and the, what Astrosat is doing, and just go quickly. And I could not stop here because we have a very exciting time at now. You can you are all familiar with the Lagrange points. Right? So this is the L1, L2, L4, L5 and near Earth orbit. So this is where Hubble is, has been working for the last 30 years. So this is an orbit which is very low Earth orbit, about 600 km. And then you have the Gaia which is going in L2, which is Lagrange point 2, which is measuring the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And then you have Astrosat which is going also in the lower low Earth orbit, about 650 km from the Earth surface. Uh, and this is, this is what the, the, uh, the uh, looking into the UV part, apart from the, also the X-ray. And now the JWST is also joining the L2. Okay. And recently, there is another satellite which is coming to L2, which is called the Euclid. And L1, we have Aditya L1 which is launched by ISRO. So we have a truly a golden age in, in space astronomy in this sense. Okay? And I wanted to show you this video is excellent. So this is the orbit of the Gaia. This is the orbit of the JWST. This is called the halo orbit. And Euclid is also in a halo orbit, but it's separated. They are not intersecting each other. So I stop here and I thank all my collaborators who have been contributing, various students, uh, outside people, external collaborators and, and, and I just stop. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. And uh, I know this was a this was a very complicated topic to explain, but uh, we appreciate the efforts of Professor Saha in simplifying things for you and with all these visuals and actually sharing, not shying from sharing the data that uh, uh, that actually astronomers work with. Because we always see the pretty pictures, right? But this is the kind of things we are <laughs> working with in the background. So that's it's been a lovely lecture. If you have any questions, we are uh, happy to. 
answer some of them. So we come to you. If you raise your hands, we can, we can come to you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I didn't understand. Uh, you said that reinvention uh, stop at uh, red shift factor of uh, red shift factor of five point five. So you gave some reasoning <coughs> behind that. Uh, why did it stop at five point five? What evidence do we have that it stopped at five point five? Uh, because we, we know, as we know, there is dark matter and dark energy is playing a role uh, as of now also. So, what is the evidence against uh, for what is okay, evidence for that the uh, revelation stopped at five point five? Uh, yes, so there are some um, observations taken by let's say the um, the light from the quasars when it travels. So, if there is a hydrogen gas, so imagine imagine a quasar is a very shiny object, okay. and light from there will come travel, and if there are hydrogen gas, neutral hydrogen gas it creates some kind of a absorption. Okay. When, and this is like measured by something called the Gunn-Peterson stuff. So, this 5.5 is actually observations taken of some quasars and it shows that the there is no such the absorption. Okay, which means there is not much of a uh, evidence for the realization. Sorry, neutral hydrogen gas. Because what the when it is reionized, which means that the between the object and you, there should not be any neutral hydrogen gas, it's all ionized. Okay, so that's the through the spectra of the quasars, one can actually probe this. Hello, yeah. Wendy. Uh, it's okay. The dark age is part, the cosmic dark age. Uh, so, you said we had hydrogen, some neutral hydrogen there. Yes. You said it was opaque. Yes. The light. So, like every light? Uh, every wavelength? Um, the first of all, um, first of all, the light that we understand from the stars and galaxies, right? So, those photons are there. Is of course, like there were CMB photons. Because when the CMB happened, the last scattering of this, the, those photons also came out. But those photons might have interacted with the with the, the, the during this time, and there might be an imprint on that. But otherwise, it's a it's a there is no new photons being generated in, the, in that when it was dark age. It's just a hydrogen gas. So, so hydrogen is opaque because there is no light. Uh, yes, because you can think about it. and if you put a hydrogen gas, like you know, unless there is an excitation and uh, de excitation, there won't be any light, anything, right? It requires some atomic transitions when for there will be like light being emitted, right? Clear or no? Yes. Yeah. Excuse me. Yes. So, why are we. Realization pro protons can be seen in filters by like infrared and ultraviolet, not like other filters from you know gamma rays and all of those. So why only infrared rays and ultraviolet rays can be seen very clearly, you know telescopes and not the other rays? Right. So so uh, yes, a very good question. Um, uh, The other rays should also be there, so um, but we need a telescope to catch those photons. Um, the, the gamma rays and this high energy photons, they are often come from a very energetic event in the universe. So, for example, it could be there is a black hole, so they can be like you know. If there is gas falls in that, so they they are emitting from the nearby region of the black hole, or there is a um, <coughs> some explosive event like gamma ray burst happening in the very early universe. So those also can 
be like seen. But we don't have a detection so far. And considering um, this, that these events could be real because when there was no many stars, there's no many galaxies, there are no no such explosive event also, right? So that is why we fall back to only catching the UV photons. Okay? Am I clear? Okay. Uh, hi, my question to you was that uh, do stars emitting green wavelength exist? And if they do, then why are they so rare to find? So, do, do stars emitting green wavelength exist? Green wavelength sense, like 5000 angstrom, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, they are there, plenty. The, the 5000 angstrom is really the yellow or this band is like some. Is one star. So the you can see that the the peak of the black body radiation is given a temperature. You can see that the, the green light, yellow light, visible spectrum is the what we can see. It's very common. Okay. Right. Yes. Thank you. So my question is that uh, you you were talking about the how a deep spin. And so did Astrosat. Uh, why was this specific area chosen to create that image? Is <laughs> there a reason for it or is it just... You mean why Hubble chose or why you chose? I mean why you chose is pretty obvious why Hubble chose is the question. Yes, I think... Um, I hope <laughs> this is not recorded but I know that... Um, um, the, 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 during the, the, the early times, early days of Hubble, um, the director had some, the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute, where the Hubble telescope is managed, um, he had the discretionary time and he wanted to say that I wanted to look at some places, there is nothing. Okay, I want to look at blank sky. So people actually criticize, call it, you might do, can't say the language, but uh, it's a, uh, it is like very wasting time, Hubble's time, precious time of the Hubble University. And um, and you know what happened after that. <laughs> Today, this, this patch of the sky is the most visited sky in the universe. Most visited sky in the universe. And, and, and that is why sometimes it's not easy to get time. If you want to observe today, I want to observe some blank patch of the sky. <laughs> so it's not possible. But I think he had, and he also faced the similar criticism. But the result was amazing. I think that's the exploration, I would say. <laughs> exactly. That is why I, when I pointed out is that there is no star. In fact, in fact, deep field should be focused into a region of the sky when there is no bright star. You know, imagine like you have a big light here and you want to see some faint close to that. You don't want that, right? So if you want to be like a faint structure, if you want to see some part of the room, you want to switch up all light and focus. Exactly that's what we try to do from the deep field. So you don't want the contamination from the bright light. So I don't see any more hands coming up. Of course, uh, you know this field is there; it's open, and new uh, developments are coming up. Maybe we'll, so we we'll take a last question from the lady, and then. Uh, okay. Why would it be known as a golden age of in space astronomy? Is there, I mean, because of new um, new discoveries that would happen, or because, um, um, or because JWST? Telescope would be going for new discoveries. Um, to me, it's uh, uh, sorry. To me, I did not know that so far. I in L two, I knew only Gaia, like which is about 2014 since, which is looking at the Milky Way, right? 
and then Hubble was on a low Earth orbit. Suddenly in L2, you have three telescopes that we know, which is exploding the deep space. So it's a it's one work in the, the Milky Way, one at the, the early universe, and then Euclid, which is started operation in like since last year. And it's like working in the infrared again in a very wide field. So this and then we have uh, already Hubble is present and Hubble is as far as I know is still healthy. It's healthy. All the instruments, like there are some decommissioned instruments there, but it's working fine. And lots of proposals, lots of people want to observe with Hubble. So it's active, even though it's 30 years old. So Hubble, General University, Euclid, Gaia, what else we want? And then on, on the on the on the on the low Earth orbit, we have Astrosat working in the UV. There was a mission, there's another UV telescope, is the Galaxy, which is decommissioned now, which is NASA satellite, similar to Astrosat, but it's not working anymore. But then we have so we have a UV, we have optical, we have infrared, like all the I mean. Nobody called, I just said that this, to me, it feels like a golden age, like while I was looking at all of this, I said, when did I see this thing? In the last 20 years? No. And this is happening in the last 10 years. So that's the sense I have in calling it. And from L1, we have Aditya L1 looking at sun. So it's like all areas covered. So it's, it's, I think it's personal opinion, it's actually showcasing the, uh, the achievements that we are having and uh, we are speaking about the golden age and out of these two of them are Indian satellites. Mm -hmm. and that's also another important thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's, it, these are exciting times for space astronomy, ground-based astronomy as well because huge observatories are coming up, uh, the 30 meter telescope, the EELT, the European Extremely Large Telescope. Uh, the square kilometer array, which is a radio telescope on two continents, the LIGO India uh, observatory is coming up again, something which Ayuga is part of. So we are also in a way part of these and proud to be associated with this. Uh, but space astronomy definitely there. I'm sure uh, you know professors like uh, 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 Professor Kanak Saha will now lead other projects which might lead to many other uh, uh, space telescopes because I know astronomers are not content with what they see. They want to see more. They want to see bigger, fainter, you know, sharper. So that's that's what we are aiming at, and uh, we'll, we'll wish all the best to the future. But also remember that many of you are students here, and all these projects need people to work in, to work on, and work uh, the data, get the results out, get you know, uh, the information about the universe. So please uh, make sure that if you are interested in this, due to this lecture or in general, yeah. so please make sure that you figure out how uh, you can contribute and you can basically study astrophysics in the future. So that is one of our goals of these uh, public lectures that we have. Let's again, stand, uh, let's again uh, thank the speaker here on stage for <laughs> the presentation.